Hello, everyone. Uh, can I ask the audience to unmute their microphones and I also uh, close their uh, cameras, if it's possible? Thank you. Hello, everyone, again. Welcome to Sidra Dokuzel University webinars. This is the fifth in our series so far. We have today two distinguished speakers. Uh, let me uh, present you the first speaker, Dr. William Misut. Uh, he is attending physician in anatomic pathology at Sidra Medicine and assistant professor at Val Cornell Medical College in Qatar. Prior to joining Sidra Medicine, he worked as a pediatric pathologist at Birmingham General Hospital, per, per, sorry, Birmingham Children's Hospital, after training at Great Ormond Street Hospital and University College Hospital in London. And he did his general pathology train, his pathology training at Adam, uh, Edinburgh's Hospital at Cambridge. He held, he held a UK National Institute of Health Research Academic Clinical Lectureship which allowed him to pursue a research in pediatric tumor genomics. Before training in pathology, Dr. Mifsud qualified in medicine uh, in his, uh, from his native uh, country of Malta and did his PhD in developmental biology at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Mifsud's clinical work uh, spans the entire range of diagnostic pediatric and perinatal pathology and special interest in the diagnosis of medical renal biopsies and pediatric renal tumors. His main research interests are in pediatric tumor evaluation and its impact in, on clinical outcome, more recently in the emerging area of digital pathology and specialty its impact on pediatric tissue diagnosis. The title of his talk is Artificial in, uh, in, uh, in Digital Pathology. Dr. Mifsud, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Erdener. Um, that was very kind uh, introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak. Let me uh, share the screen with you. C can you confirm that you can see the, 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 the my screen, please? Yes, uh, yes I, uh, we, do, we do. Perfect, perfect. So I have uh, nothing to disclose. Before, before start, can I ask the uh, audience uh, to write their questions uh, or comments at the chat box? We are going to have the questions uh, at the end of two talks. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak and for the very kind introduction. Um, so, so yeah, so basically today I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, digitization and pathology, and then a little bit of time about types of AI and how we can apply AI in pathology um, with some examples of, of these applications. Um, and I'd like to emphasize some particular challenges, especially when it comes to using um, these applications in actual uh, clinical diagnostic practice. Um, and then maybe I'll, I'll close with a few very subjective uh, reflections on what I think the histopathologist of the future will, um, will look like. Um, some of my considerations there especially will tend to be biased towards pediatric pathology because as you heard, that's, that's my main area of uh, practice. So digitization in pathology, we're essentially two decades plus behind uh, radiology. Um, why is that? For those of you in the audience who are not pathologists, um, uh, basically our process is a little bit more complicated to digitize than radiologists. And the reason is that what we do in the laboratory every day is we go from taking chunks of tissue varying in size from very tiny needle core biopsies to entire organs, um, and we process them until we obtain from those tissues um, uh, permanently preserved slides with very thin sections of tissue on them that are stained. Um, and uh, we then analyze those slides under a microscope and, and uh, basically make up our mind on, on, on the basis of what we see. And we communicate uh, our findings to our clinical colleagues so that they may make the right uh, diagnosis and treatment. Now, this process is um, quite cumbersome. It takes time. It takes money. Um, it takes, yeah a few days usually until we have the, the, the slides. And then on top of that, um, you need the pathologist to analyze those slides that you make. But 
tissue pathology remains highly clinically useful. Um, all cancers require a tissue diagnosis. Um, and especially on the pediatric setting, um, many inflammatory diseases and plenty of other conditions ranging from rare to common, um, uh, basically they present us with a role to play in establishing or at least refining the diagnosis and therefore assigning the patient to the right uh, treatment group. Um, so even after we've prepared the slides, um, the process um, remains uh, cumbersome, if not more cumbersome. On one side, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, uh, <clears throat> physical slides are very easy to break. Uh, the, the stains on them can fade. Physical slides are very easy to lose and are often irreplaceable, especially when the material comes from very small biopsies. So you lose one or two slides, you've lost the entire case. Um, in addition, physical microscopes are ridiculously expensive. They're difficult to move around. So everything is quite um, problematic in, 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 in some ways. Um, however, probably the most cumbersome part of the entire process is us, uh, the pathologists. Um, there is a limited number of us, and it seems that uh, from, from, from studies carried out by some of our friends, our number is actually shrinking. We are difficult to train. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And on top of that, even those of us who are trained, um, we still remain human, um, which means we come with problems of inter-observer and intra-observer variability. Now, I'd like to draw attention to the fact, jumping the gun a bit, that if we're going to train computer models, of course, the gold standard um, data, at least for supervised models, remains our diagnosis, which is indeed subject to this inter- and intra-observer um, uh, variability. So this is quite a substantial problem we have. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, um, what we like to do is ask a friend. Uh, we have these specialized microscopes with at least uh, two heads. And you can see here um, an experienced uh, pathologist getting uh, giving a second opinion to her uh, younger colleague. And if you're wondering why they're smiling, uh, I like to say this is because how we pathologists make eye contact. Of course, you can expand this, and in many big departments, you see these enormous, extremely expensive spider microscopes. Um, and it's not just the microscope that's expensive there. Um, here you're seeing a situation where you're reviewing one single slide by a large number of pathologists. So right now, all the funds you devote to funding your pathologists are going in their entirety uh, towards assessing one slide. However, this is very important because this is our uh, best available way of reducing inter-observer variability and uh, trying to obtain uh, more precision, if not accuracy, in our diagnoses. Now, um, the extreme end of this process is to, of course, undertake central pathology review, um, which is to say that we even send slides from one center to another to specific pre-assigned experts. This is usually done within the context of a study or trial or both. Um, and then the treatment decision if the central pathology review is done rapidly, um, it can be indeed made the treatment decision on the basis of the expert central pathology review rather than only the institutional uh, pathologist's opinion. Now, is this worthwhile? There are many instances where this is indeed proven to be worthwhile. Here I'm just highlighting one particular paper looking at central pathology review in, uh, in a particular aspect of uh, breast cancer treatment. And uh, in many papers, um, there is this figure of somewhere between 25-30% significant discordance between central pathology review and institutional pathology um, opinion, which is quite a large number. And it, many studies of central pathology review remain um, throughout the years with such high uh, discrepancies. Another study is a study I, 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 I was involved with. Um, because here at SIDRA, we have uh, one of our colleagues is uh, Professor Gordon Vujanic, who's a world expert in the uh, diagnosis of uh, pediatric kidney tumor tissues. Um, and we did a study of about 18, 19 years worth of cases from the UK and Ireland. And we saw that the diagnosis of anaplasia, which is probably the single most important diagnostic feature in Wilms tumors, um, is subject to, again, 28% uh, discrepancies that are actually uh, significant clinically. Um, now, of course, you might say, why don't we just do central pathology review for everything? It's just because it's not feasible. As I said, we already don't have enough pathologists um, to diagnose 
um, the, the, the bulk of the work that we have today. So can you imagine if on top of that we had to do central pathology review becomes even more difficult. And also uh, the experts are often limited in number and, uh, you know, um, we humans are not immortal. So we're subject to the usual to the usual issues. So um, you might say, fortunately, um, this process of uh, asking a crowd for opinion or asking experts for opinion works not only in human beings. This is one of my favorite papers in uh, pathology all the way back from uh, 2015. Um, and basically, this group managed to train pigeons um, to recognize and distinguish uh, between benign and malignant uh, samples in uh, breast cancer. Um, so... I have to highlight that, um, you know, one one easy way of mischaracterizing the study is that, of course, the pigeons are replicating everything a pathologist does uh, when it comes to the diagnosis of breast cancer. Of course, they don't. All they are doing is taking a snapshot that is pre-chosen and deciding whether one sample is benign or malignant. And uh, in the bottom right here, you can see an ROC curve. And interestingly, any individual pigeon does relatively well, although probably not as well as a trained human observer. However, um, in what rather tongue-in-cheek they called flock sourcing rather than crowdsourcing, if you take the opinions of all the pigeons together, you end up with a quite impressive uh, specificity and sensitivity performance um, that, that pretty much matches um, uh, human expert performance. Now, of course, um, I have here a video, but in the interest of time, I, I will, I will, I will skip this. You will just see the pigeon making the distinction and getting a treat. Um, of course, this was reported uh, in the most uh, exaggerated way possible. Um, you know that pigeons were going to replace us as pathologists to diagnose uh, benign versus uh, malignant tumors. Of course. It was implied that we pathologists have uh, brains comparable to bird brains. All it takes is a pigeon brain to do our job and more directly will be replaced by pigeons. Of course, this has not happened. Um, the, 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 the point I'm making is that at least some of the tasks that we carry out, if you boil them down, um, there are they are not necessarily dependent on being human to carry them out. Now, of course, any one pathologist carries out, I would say, thousands of these tasks to an expert degree. So to replicate one whole pathologist is quite difficult. And on top of that, what we pathologists do that pigeons or computers find much harder to do, um, we're relatively good at communicating why we say something is benign or malignant. So we are not entire black boxes, yeah? Um, and I think that remains and will remain important, especially in medical applications when it comes to diagnoses. So when I said earlier that we're decades behind radiology, I meant it. Um, uh, there are very, very few places where um, AI applications and pathology are being used commercially or in hospitals, but that is starting to grow in the last year or two. However, in my hospital, um, we are using AI in radiology already. There's a fairly widely available tool. You just pay, you install the software. Um, and we use this tool, or our radiology colleagues use this tool to assess the bone age in uh, children. It works very well. And it saves our radiologists a ton of time because for radiologists to do this task manually takes, I am told, an absolute minimum of 30 minutes, if not longer. Whereas this tool just does it automatically. And by the time the radiologist goes to report the radiograph, there's already the assessment of bone age done in the background. Um, so a little overview of different types of AI going from feature engineering to deep learning and also supervised versus unsupervised learning. So artificial intelligence is defined as any system that can perceive its environment and take actions that maximize its chance of achieving, of achieving its goals. Now, in general, we prefer to think of systems where the goals are set by humans although probably one day with generalizable AI, we will have system that even can determine their own goals. Um, on a much more simple and focused level in pathology, typical goals um, include a combination of segmentation, um, where you basically group any number of pixels in a patholo pathology image and say that they belong together in one object, and then classifying those objects into different classes. Now, a subset of AI relates to those algorithms that can improve with experience. And that is essentially the definition of um, machine learning. Now, again, within machine learning, a subset is uh, deep learning applications. This typically re re relates to neural networks with uh, many layers. 
And uh, without going into the details of how this works, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a computer engineer, I'm not a data scientist. Um, uh, I'm trying to show here this rather busy slide. On the left, we have traditional machine learning approaches, which have been going on in the field for more than six decades. And on the right, we have uh, some explanation of uh, deep learning. And what I would say is simply a couple of points to take away um, here is that with traditional machine learning, we must engineer the features. So we must predefine the features that we want the algorithm to pay attention to. Yeah, they may be related to object shape, texture, color, et cetera, et cetera. And then we use combinations of these features to train a model to classify it as data. Um, uh, and with training rounds, the model uses the features we decide upon, but it actually improves as it is fed data. Um, with deep learning, we don't need to decide what features we want the model to pay attention to. The model learns the features as well as how to optimize its uh, interpretation of them. Um, what I would say is the most important part of this slide is this box highlighted in red here, um, uh, where basically the performance of these models um, is affected by data volume. But with traditional machine learning approaches, where you decide the features, you typically have a rapid improvement in performance with increase in the available data for, for training your model. But that quickly um, becomes uh, asymptotic and stops improving dramatically. Um, with deep learning, um, the amount of data you require for high performance is higher. And the more data you keep feeding, you typically keep improving your performance to a much higher level. So um, one consideration when you're designing what approach to take for a particular use case, um, it's not necessarily always the case that deep learning is better, um, uh, but especially if you don't have enormous amounts of, of uh, data available. And this is relevant um, in some settings, especially in pediatric pathology, where we have to deal with a range of very rare diseases that we're expected to diagnose accurately. Um, Yeah. So um, very quickly, um, uh, all of these approaches can take the form of supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is really what most computational pathology applications um, use. Um, and it essentially means that we provide some sort of uh, classification data to the model so that it can learn from our, from our uh, classes. Whereas with unsupervised learning, you allow the computer, the machine, to completely decide for itself where it places the boundaries between different classes. So some applications of AI in pathology, a whirlwind tour. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what's happened and then we'll wrap up with uh, the actual practical application and, and its potential. So this is probably uh, the most important paper in the field, I would say, all the way back from 2011. Um, I remember when it came out, it was, I just remember being extremely impressed. So this group used uh, traditional machine learning approaches um, uh, to try to see if they could uh, predict outcome in breast cancer images from tissue microarrays um, from two cohorts, one in Holland, one in the US. Um, and what they did, they decided a priori what features to engineer. Um, now, while as many of you know, the features we use diagnostically to decide on the grade of breast cancer and predict outcome and associate, associate patients with the right treatment are dependent on the appearances of the cancer cells. Um, this group said, well, okay, let's engineer features related to the cancer cells, what they call the epithelial features. But let's also, out of interest, see if we can engineer features based on the stroma, i.e. non-cancer cells in the milieu of the, of the cancer. Um, and interestingly, what they found is that the best eight epithelial features could distinguish patients um, with poor and better outcome quite well. But even better than that were the three best stromal features, yeah, that, that, that could uh, predict outcome even better than the eight best epithelial features. Of course, the best performing model was when they combined these epithelial and uh, stromal features. But I think the outcome of this paper is, is quite telling. And that what it's telling us is that there's actually more information in H and E images than we can process, or that at least than we can choose to process. To process, um, th some of this extra information is indeed clinically useful, and importantly, some of it can be mined even with traditional machine learning, all the way back in 2011. So you can imagine what happens when deep learning starts to be applied to to digital pathology. And indeed, um, this is 
the earliest application of deep learning I could find in uh, pathology, or at least in tissue pathology, where there was this competition um, uh, for, for uh, mitosis detection in a predetermined uh, data set. And you can see uh, this group who published this paper publi uh, submitted three models, all of them based on deep learning. And these three models were the three best performing models compared to all the others, which were based on traditional machine learning, at least for this problem of finding um, uh, mitotic cells in breast cancer histology images. So huge potential already becoming apparent 10 years ago. Then, of course, the classic application of uh, deep learning in, uh, in digital pathology is basically finding cancer on whole slide images. Even if the cancer is only a very small part of the image, the sort of needle in a haystack approach. And uh, this kind of approach is now present in uh, commercially available algorithms that you can um, implement in your diagnostic lab, especially to find malignant glands in prostate biopsies and uh, uh, invasive uh, malignant glands in uh, breast uh, lesional biopsies. And this is helping pathologists work more efficiently and also more accurately and precisely. Um, so there were also applications of deep learning for host light imaging uh, quality control from the group of uh, Metingur Chan. Um, uh, this is something that non-pathologists might not appreciate, but as soon as you start digitizing images, you immediately run into problems with slides that are out of focus, and it takes a lot of time to screen them for out of focus, scan again, et cetera, et cetera. So, this model that can automatically find out of focus regions, you can use to implement in practice so that automatically you know which slides you need to rescan before you make everything available to the pathologist for uh, diagnosis. Now, beyond this, however, uh, more recently, there have been some amazing applications of uh, deep learning on the HND, on the humble HND uh, technology from the 1880s to try to predict molecular features um, and clinical outcome. Um, just from the HND, from tissue microarrays, this paper, which I really like from Heather Couture, um, basically they, they obtained pretty good rates of accuracy of inferring the estrogen receptor status in breast cancer without actually staining for the estrogen receptor. I think this has important implications because, as you know, not all labs, especially in medium and low income settings, can afford to uh, carry out estrogen receptor assessment and interpret it. Whereas if potentially we could have an accurate algorithm that can do it just from the HND, this might uh, basically broaden access to molecular subtyping or virtual molecular subtyping to a greater number of patients who might uh, live in uh, resource settings that are not so rich. Um, beyond this now, from 2018 onwards, we started achieving uh, performance that uh, is better than human experts at uh, predicting outcome in a number of different cancers. This is the first one I could find, which is in colorectal cancer. Um, and beyond that, coming back to mutational status now, um, there was this amazing paper in 2019 from, from, from Jakob Nicolas Kather, where basically from gastrointestinal cancers, H and D images, um, not even whole slide images, they could predict quite accurately microsatellite instability, which as I'm sure you know, um, is a very important prognostic factor. Um, and then they generalized this approach and uh, started finding clinically actionable genetic mutations across cancers only from h and uh, tissue microarrays. Now, if all these applications are so good, why am I here talking to you? Why, why have I not been replaced by a machine? Why do I still have a job? And why are we not doing this routinely even? So one important and uh, very big problem is generalizability in that a model trained on one data set tends to do worse on a data set from a different center. And by worse, I mean a lot worse. Um, this is related to difficulties of training on multi-center data. Every department has its own slightly different slide preparation protocols. There are different scanner platforms. There are, of course, different patient populations with different distributions of disease conditions. So your uh, model weights and biases might be optimized for a particular population and might not work as accurately in a different population with different disease prevalences. And also to try to overcome this, we have uh, regulatory rule, regulatory restrictions that uh, do not allow us to easily share and move data between different centers. So even if we want to collaborate, it might not be so easy to move my data to your center or to another center or get me get another center's data. So what can we do about this? Last year, there was this amazing, beautiful paper 
that basically used uh, blockchain-based technology um, to do federated learning, they called it swarm learning, where essentially data sets from Northern Ireland, Germany, and the United States were used to build one model um, uh, to basically predict um, outcome and molecular states um, from these cancer samples, sorry. Um, but the way they did it, they didn't move a single whole slide image from one center to the other, but instead they had this uh, blockchain uh, based method where basically I would start training my model on, let's say one image in center one, um, that would update the weights in my nascent model. Um, I share those weights, not the data with all the centers. And then we do the next round of training, say on an image from center two, we update the weights, and then we do the next round of training on an image from center three. And we do that training in, in, uh, in each different center. And each time we just share with each other the weights and track the development of the model using the blockchain. I think this is gonna be particularly important especially in fields like pediatric pathology, where we need many different centers collaborating because we have rare diseases. Now, finally, I will spend one minute, if I, if I may, on uh, the problem of black box models. All these models we've seen, even if they work very well with data from a large number of centers, have a problem that uh, we humans are a little bit better at, at, which is if you ask a model, why are you telling me that this slide is this particular cancer with this particular grade, with this particular outcome and treatment implications, um, usually these models tend to struggle to show you that or explain it at least um, in easy to interpret terms. Um, whereas we humans are a little bit better than that. One way of, 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 of demonstrating this problem, um, this happened a few years ago, someone trained this really cool uh, method to distinguish between huskies and wolves, which even to humans, are, are, are not a million miles apart. They can be quite tricky to distinguish. Um, uh, however, this model did great, except there was this one image where it kept getting it wrong. So it kept saying this was an image of a wolf, whereas actually this is a husky. Um, so then the researchers wanted to try to understand why it was making this consistent error on what should be a relatively easy use case. Um, and uh, they tried to see what pixels were being looked at by the model. And it turned out there was bias in the training set and what the model had learned that uh, all the wolves in the training set had been pictured on backgrounds with snow because they were in the wild, whereas all the huskies uh, in the training set had been pictured in gardens with, with, with uh, green grass behind them. So the model simply took a shortcut and decided if there's a white background, I call it wolf. If there's a green background, I call it uh, husky. And the training data set that gave 100% accurate performance. In the test set, that was not the case. So when you have black box models, you have to be a little bit careful because if they make a mistake, uh, the mistake can be catastrophic, especially if you don't understand how the model is making its decision. Um, additional challenges remain related to huge amounts of data and economics. Um, so where do we go from there? I think the pediatric pathologist of the future will not be replaced by machines but it will be the pediatric pathologist and general tissue pathologist who uses machines who will replace the pathologist who does not. Um, and I think this is a more optimistic view than say Jeffrey Hinton's view that basically we should stop training radiologists because within five years, which has come and gone, deep learning is gonna do better than radiologists. With all due respect, I think one thing he did not understand is that it's not just the distinction and finding the tumors. We have an important role in communicating findings to our clinical colleagues that remains difficult to resolve with, with uh, AI. Sorry for overrunning a bit. Thank you for allowing me to get to the end of the talk. I'll be very happy to take questions, but I think we'll have questions towards the end of both talks, right, Erdener? Yes, you're right. Thank uh, you. Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, so let's move uh, to the next speaker, Professor Sulan uh, Sariolo, uh, graduated from Hacettepe University Faculty of Medicine in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, until 1992, she worked uh, as a resident in pathology and qualify qualified as a pathologist. Then she joined the Dokuzel University Department of Pathology. Uh, she has been working uh, there uh, as a full uh, professorship uh, since uh, 2002 where she was the chair of uh, the department for one term. Uh, in 1999, she developed her skills further at the University of Birmingham. Uh, she had been also the chair of the Kuzel University Molecular Pathology Department in the Institute of uh, Health Sciences. 
Uh, she worked as the vice uh, CMO of the Dokuzer University Hospital from 2000 to 2004. She's a member of the European Society of Pathology, the Renal Pathology Society, as well. Also, European Society of Pediatric uh, sorry, Pathology had a uh, neck uh, uh, tumors, and she has been working in the uh, variety of working groups in Federation of uh, Turkish Federation of Pathology Societies. Uh, she has re uh, written uh, many books, including Tumor Deposit Mechanism Morphology and Prognostics Implications, uh, published by Spring Care in 2018. She has many uh, international papers, over 400, and uh, many citations, over 2,000. Uh, the talk of uh, the title of her talk is in silica approach in molecular pathology. Professor Sarola, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Ardener, uh, for the organization, uh, kind invitation, and presenting me like that. And also, I want to thank uh, Dr. William Mitzvot uh, for Mitzvot for his excellent uh, talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, best wishes to uh, Sidra. Uh, medical uh, and research center. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, meeting. Um, so I hope uh, you see my slides right now. Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you. Um, so the uh, dear participants uh, and uh, Dear Sidra Medical uh, Center uh, participants, uh, I want to say hello from Izmir, Turkey. Uh, this online uh, meetings allow us to uh, come together in uh, different uh, ways. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, in silico uh, approach in molecular pathology. I have nothing to disclose. So I want to first uh, start asking by a question. Um, do we need uh, more sequencing data or should we be analyzing? Uh, this is also, this we can term as also um, translational research, uh, uh, or should we do keep on doing both? Uh, sequencing uh, allows us to have uh, multiple uh, um, information, very precious information, uh, but it has some uh, multiple expenses and uh, the digital storing is always expanding. Uh, we can uh, share this data and uh, should can use and should use it in the best way, uh, the sequence data. So what does in silico analysis mean? Uh, an in silico experiment is one performed on computer or via computer simulation. Uh, in silicon uh, comes from the Latin word in silicio actually, uh, referring to silicon in computer chips. Uh, it's a coined term like in Latin words in vivo, in vitro, and in situ, which are very frequently used by us also in biologists. Uh, so um, are we very familiar with these in silico methods? Uh, I mean, the pathologists, oncologists, neurologists, and rheumatologists. Uh, and I really wonder if uh, bioinformatics and or in silico methods are uh, part of the undergrad curriculum in Qatar. Uh, not for now. For us, the answer is no. We don't have it under uh, uh, undergrad curriculum. I think uh, we should have. Uh, the earliest uh, time it was used is uh, 1987 uh, by Christopher Langton uh, to characterize biological experiments carried out entirely in a computer. It was used in 1989. Uh, and in silico originally applied only to computer simulations that... Uh, so, excuse me, we don't see your uh, slides moving forward. Don't you? I. Um, what can I do? I don't know. Let's... Uh, uh, do you see the... Now, the, it's, yeah, yeah, now, now, now we see now, yes. Now, uh, let me keep it like that then. I won't uh, take it to the presentation mode. Maybe it will help. Uh, the problem is that in this case, uh, the um, system underlies some of the terms. That's why I want to say it otherwise. Sorry for the uh, red lines under some of the words then. Uh, so um, what we use it for now uh, seems mostly for drug discovery, it's virtual screening, and also it's used in cell models. Uh, resources develop and in silico model of tuberculosis to aid in drug discovery uh, for 
uh, tuberculosis in 2007, but it wasn't very successful. Uh, now it's mostly used for genetics and molecular pathology and digital genetic sequences stored in sequence databases can be analyzed or maybe digitally altered uh, or be used as templates for creating new actual DNA using artificial gene synthesis and mostly for translational research. Uh, so, um, so what when we look uh, at what uh, the in silico methods in pathology depend upon, uh, we have big data of health people and clinical and pathological features of patients and diseases and big data sets of RNA, uh, DNA, different types of RNA and methylation information. And we have tools of analysis. I mean, we have both uh, some uh, data uh, sets and also tools for analysis. That's that's what making makes up the in silico research uh, or evaluation possible. We have many data sets uh, with lots of effort for producing them. And we have some analysis sets uh, like gene enrichment analysis tools, functional gene enrichment analysis tools, uh, and uh, um, some uh, um, uh, uh, applications to provide interpretation of uh, user provided gene lists. Uh, so I, at this point, uh, we can just uh, see the one of the most uh, familiar uh, data sets that we have information about. I guess we all know about this one, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, the, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, research network uh, uh, made a lot of uh, um, digitalization uh, for uh, different types of cancers and suggested uh, molecular pathology classification of cancers. And this is, I just gave one example. There are many uh, publications like that uh, in different uh, types of cancers. And we are uh, using this information to better characterize uh, the uh, cancer we are uh, dealing with. And also, they didn't stop there. And for example, I think this is a very good uh, paper, uh, the driver fusions and their implications in the development and treatment of human cancers. Uh, they uh, published this in 2018. Uh, they had uh, more than 9,000 tumors uh, of 33 cancer types. And uh, they identified many fusions uh, with, their, uh, with this uh, data. And then uh, search if they are um, functional uh, or, uh, and they found that uh, they were uh, one percent more than one percentage was uh, driver fusions. So uh, these driver fusions, uh, you know, sometimes uh, let us understand a new type of type of uh, cancer. Now we have some uh, translocation named carcinomas. Uh, and the uh, identifying fusions is something very valuable. Um, so um, I really um, want to see if there are uh, some advantages and disadvantages of in silico uh, studies. Uh, first of all, uh, for these cases, uh, legal, reg legal regulations are completed and ethical issues are settled. Uh, for having a data set like that, uh, the uh, countries, um, um, law should allow uh, the um, uh, accumulation of this data and public, uh, sharing it. Uh, and also the ethics uh, issues should allow a person to give permission for a wide range of uh, applications uh, with their data. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the patients should give a very good um, informed consent. Uh, and also the personalization of the data should be excellent. Uh, also, um, there should be a standardized uh, data storage in order to uh, make um, uh, comparisons of these uh, data of different patients from different centers uh, and uh, being allowed to, to share all this information. Deciding to share all this information is a lot of effort and it's very positive, I think. Uh, so I also think that uh, this allows us to use the world's um, um, uh, sources, resources uh, in an environmentally very effective way uh, so that uh, whatever uh, we have, uh, we can be do best analysis and uh, achieve the most out of it. Uh, and uh, this means less waste, even uh, um, 
uh, unnecessary storage of uh, DNA data or RNA data is a problem. Uh, so sharing it and making it useful is, uh, I think, very clever. And also, uh, most of the time, no, fun no re need for funding. Uh, so what can be uh, the uh, problematic sides of that? Uh, actually, we may be looking for trying to make a research, but a similar result might, results might have been published. So we should really look through uh, our what are we what we are doing. We can just read the uh, articles otherwise, and also uh, the methodological differences between uh, the studies should be um, strictly evaluated. Uh, because uh, I mean the data set uh, should not take. Uh, uh, if a data is not ap appropriate, but uh, we should be very careful about it uh, if we are using them. So uh, at this point, I really want to thank uh, a lot for providing this big data for analysis to the patients who allow us to have the uh, is, have their data, the medical doctors, uh, the bio bioinformatics scientists, and to all the organizations. I think we should thank, uh, this is a very big contribution, I think, but uh, to tell you the truth, we want some more things. We still need more data sharing. Uh, if you are uh, having some um, research like that, and if you have DNA and RNA data, and if your country allows you to share it, I think this is a very good idea to share it. But for my country, we are not allowed to do that for now. Our regulations do not allow us. Uh, and we, the pathologists, I mean, need more digitalized images of the cases. Uh, unfortunately, there are lots of uh, patient data like that, but very few of them have uh, digitalized images. Uh, after the uh, last talk, we can easily uh, guess that uh, AI uh, applications can be combined with molecular data and digitalized uh, patient uh, histopathological uh, slides uh, easily. But uh, we need to have the digitalized images more often. And also, uh, for now, most of the images that we can reach are from TCGA data. Uh, but um, most of the cases, there are only one or two slides. Uh, which I think um, expanding this feature in different data sets would be very uh, fruitful for the pathologist's uh, help and also combined uh, research uh, for uh, AI on uh, both digitalized data and on uh, the genetic uh, or molecular pathologic data. Uh, so um, I just want to keep on a little bit about what we did. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we uh, worked as a group. Uh, we had a little bit more time as pathologists during the pandemic because the operations were just, uh, not being performed as much as before. Uh, but some of us had to work at the hospital uh, for uh, helping patients. Uh, but anyway, uh, we uh, our, our molecular pathology PhD program, which is one of the first ones uh, in the world also, uh, uh, we have now, uh, it's, it started in uh, 2018, and uh, now we have uh, 17 students. Uh, some of the students, with some of the students, I, were, uh, I started working in silico with them, and then we shared our information during this time. Uh, we had these uh, two uh, books uh, uh, publications, and we had uh, the online um, working. Uh, we had a chance to work online with them. So uh, I really want to um, thank uh, Hassan Topar uh, for his uh, excellent performance in these in silico studies. Uh, first by uh, working on his project and then sharing the information with uh, the other. Um, PhD students uh, who are actually, as you can see, um, uh, they are mostly academicians, uh, but they are willing to work uh, as a P at a PhD program. Uh, and uh, with them, we kept on uh, doing some research in uh, with in silico methods, uh, and uh, we had support from the uh, Dokuzeli University bioinformatics Science scientists also. So what we did was uh, I, uh, we had. Uh, Nearly everyone had one research pro pro project and some uh, uh, presentations at the national congresses, and some of them will be presented at the European Congress of Pathology now. We're trying to make some uh, 
articles out of them. But I want to give only a few examples of what can be done with these methods. Uh, one, of, uh, one of them is uh, making some study about morphomolecular pathology. Uh, this was, uh, this is uh, the most uh, precious thing for the pathologists, I think. Uh, I feel most excited about this one. Uh, the other ones are very important, I think, but the pathology really is interesting for us. Uh, this we made, uh, the, uh, we worked with uh, Zeynep and Hassan in this study, and I will just give a brief summary in um, uh, English now. We worked on uh, serrated adenocarcinomas, uh, and uh, this is a subtype of uh, colorectal adenocarcinoma with uh, distinct morphologic features and poor prognosis. Uh, there is sparse information about molecular pathologic features, uh, and we asked could in silico findings provide information. Uh, most of the time, most of the time, they are listed among uh, adenocarcinomas of the colorectum. So we went through digital slides uh, for now in is a par part of uh, it, them were evaluated so it will be all cases and uh, with this uh, data uh, we could uh, differentiate the uh, cases with uh, serrated adenocarcinoma morphology through the tcga provided virtual images and then uh, the cbi portal provided us dna and rna sequencing results and patient survival so we could analyze uh, sorry so we could analyze uh, the uh, DNA uh, mostly most frequently mutated uh, genes, uh, most frequent uh, copy number alterations mm -hmm. and uh, methylation uh, results and survival analysis. So I think this was uh, very uh, interesting to perform and really I hope uh, more uh, and more digitalized uh, images uh, for uh, the cases with uh, DNA and RNA data. The other uh, project we went on, kept on with, uh, provided uh, us with high number of cases. I want to give it as an example for that. Uh, this project was uh, performed with uh, Sibel uh, and Hassan. Uh, we uh, went along uh, uh, colorectal carcinoma cases for uh, the frequency and importance of agnostic and candidate tumor agnostic biomarkers. And uh, with in silico analysis, uh, we had a chance to go on with 3,546 cases. Well, this is a really high number even for Tur Turkey. Uh, you know, uh, generally such high numbers we can see in, um, in any type of research. I can see such high numbers mostly in Chinese uh, research because they have a big population. Uh, anyway, it's really uh, for us. It's really also expensive to have and expensive and laborious for having so much um, uh, sequencing data. Uh, the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering metastatic events and tropism data was used also, and uh, with this uh, large number of uh, cases, we could. Um, make uh, meaningful patient groups in order to also uh, see the uh, subregions of colon, uh, which are suggested to have different uh, prognostic and um, um, mechanistic uh, features. Uh, so uh, we, we could work on a big data like that. Uh, and we had uh, information about mutually exclusive and co-occurrence trends, amplifications, missense mutations. Uh, we could analyze lots and lots of features, uh, and we could also uh, give uh, good answers to the uh, distribution of mutations along the uh, colon subregions. Uh, the other uh, 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 case I want to present is, uh, sorry, the, the uh, other project we had was about uh, an orphan disease. Uh, the, uh, the series of rare cases, we call them orphan diseases, as you know. Uh, and uh, just at that point, I just want to ask you uh, if you ever have crossed, uh, come across this book, uh, Chasing My Cure. Uh, it's uh, from a, a medical doctor uh, who had a rare disease uh, which could not be um, uh, diagnosed for a long time. Uh, but uh, after it was diagnosed, uh, as there was no certain cure, he had to communicate with lots of people uh, and lots of doctors from the world who have this uh, a disease or have experience in this disease. They um, 
uh, accumulated all the uh, rare disease uh, data in order to find a cure. And at, at the end, they were successful. Still, I will just make, uh, just uh, I guess uh, there are many pathologists here actually. He just said uh, the disease, uh, this diagnosis was made by a biopsy as Kessel's disease, just only that. Uh, actually, it's also a really rare disease, and the pathologist gave the correct diagnosis, and uh, his or her name was not mentioned in the book, although there were many uh, doctors uh, described in detail in the book. So sometimes we pathologists are not uh, the uh, easily seen heroes. Okay, I'll return to the in silico analysis now. I just want to show that uh, uh, this... Uh, Orphan diseases is a big problem because making the data, if you don't make the data together, uh, you cannot do uh, any objective uh, um, solution about them. Uh, our uh, rare disease was adenoid cystic carcinoma. For us, the pathologist, it's not a very rare disease, but it is a rare disease if you compare it with the other ones. Uh, it's actually listed among the orphan diseases. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, for that, uh, Hassan, I have told that uh, Hassan Topper has made a really uh, very good uh, work. Uh, so I really want to thank him for all his efforts. Uh, he went through the CBO portal and cosmic uh, data sets. And then he came out with uh, the um, uh, mutations, fusions, and uh, copy number alterations in CBO portal. And then in uh, the cosmic, uh, there were, uh, again, rare cases of adenoid cystic carcinoma cases. And he went on with the uh, mutations, the most frequent mutations. And then uh, the um, RNA expressions uh, were also evaluated. Uh, but you see there were uh, only few cases that could be evaluated in some of the uh, data series. But still, if you combine all of them, it's valuable. And uh, he used uh, gene pathway enrichment, uh, gene profile, GSAA, uh, gene ontology, WebGES, Salt, David, uh, uh, cytoscape enrichment map. And he came out with many uh, data. I just don't want to give in, to get into detail from all of these data sets, but he came out with the um, enrichment plots of six cancer hallmarks, uh, the uh, it's significantly ancient uh, in uh, uh, dif differentiated adenoid cystic carcinomas and also the heat map uh, of differentially expressed genes in adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, and uh, I think this information is really valuable. And also uh, he went through the um, uh, pathway analysis in order to understand uh, which pathways are mostly affected in uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma cases. Uh, so uh, another uh, thing that we can uh, that we could use, to use uh, in uh, since silico analysis was to understand any relationships of genes and pathways. Actually, we made a um, review uh, article about uh, micropapillary carcinomas with Zeynep, uh, and uh, in order to uh, understand uh, which pathways are mostly affected, uh, we just used the analysis tools. Uh, uh, for uh, the differentially expressed mRNAs uh, in these cases. And so that we could uh, understand which pathways was mostly affected uh, with these uh, lesions, uh, giving answer to uh, really uh, the pathogenesis of micropapillary changes. Um, so I think uh, I'm coming to the end of my uh, talk. My last words, I, I tried to summarize in silico analysis methods with examples. Uh, hope to have more uh, molecular pathologic in, in silico research. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we can uh, give light to more patients. Questions to the spe speakers. First of all, uh, William, uh, can I ask... You are unmuted. Hi. Can I ask a question about future directions of digital pathology? You, you, do you assume that it's going to be from the diagnostic side or precise medicine side? Well, I think the two will uh, probably become one and the same thing, right? Um, so I find it particularly exciting that we can potentially predict molecular features from HNDs, uh, for instance. 
Um, and I think that 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 with increasing uh, use of these models and hopefully figuring out ways to keeping them robust between different populations, different laboratories, um, and different scanners, I think we'll come to a point where potentially digital pathology will stop being a more expensive way of doing pathology, however good it is. So you can only really apply it in settings where you can afford the investment. But I think it will become, hopefully, a way in which we can actually start um, helping patients in settings where otherwise they don't have access to molecular tests on their tissue. Um, and with just an h and and a scanner, which seem to be going down in cost, eventually we'll be able to assign them to the right treatment groups. And um, even beyond specific molecular features, I think that the promise here is, okay, an h and is old fashioned, but it has a lot of information, albeit unstructured, um, that can capture sometimes you know, multiple molecular features, more something like genomic instability across the whole genome, for instance, right? Um, so, yeah, to 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 summarize, I think the future will 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 there will really be some very exciting applications of uh, um, applying basically analysis of H and D images to to try to extract much more information than we currently do, and if we manage that, I think that will actually increase the applicability of digital pathology around the world, regardless of how how well resourced the health healthcare settings are. Thank you. Aslan, not a question, but a comment. Uh, I, I see your agreement of, of it. Uh, I read a couple of papers regarding the use of in silica models instead of physical samples uh, for validation of NGS uh, pipelines. Uh, do you think that it's a good uh, idea or is, does it have any advantage over physical uh, samples uh, to use uh, silicon models for validation as a quality control in histopathology? Uh, I think uh, it can be an option. Um, but uh, I think the pipe, I, I would keep on with uh, classical pipeline uh, mm. for some time. Because I... I read on in that paper saying that especially in some kind of uh, medium site insertions and in, in silico models are uh, more uh, useful to detect these kind of uh, variants. Probably that would be an advantage in using those in quality control in histopathology. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for both uh, speakers uh, for their excellent uh, uh, thoughts. Um, before ending the session, I would like to highlight that we are streaming the recorded uh, sessions in YouTube. Uh, everyone can have uh, can log in YouTube and have the, uh, see can see the streamed uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone joining to us. Uh, I hope to see you in the next uh, webinar soon. Bye-bye.